It's what happens when you let merchants run amok, ruthless and rapacious as hungry, swarming rats, devouring and despoiling and showing no mercy, nor any morsels left for tomorrow, neither. Hail and well met, Realms fans. I am Ivan of Many Realms, and welcome to Baldur's Gate. Originally part of the Forgotten Realms, Baldur's Gate has become widely known due to the massive success of the video game series by the same name. In this episode of Realms Lore, Ed Greenwood explores this commercial epicenter and exposes the dark secret which festers right under the surface of this otherwise peaceful city. So, comment on this video if you think you have any idea what this deep dark secret might be, and be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you never miss out on anything Ed is putting out. Also, Ed mentions a super special spell at the end of this episode, which I won't spoil, but he's written it up, he's made it 5e compatible, and he's offering it completely for free through the Patreon. So be sure to follow the link in the description and uh, let us know if you use it in your next game. But enough of this gibbering mouther, I present to you, Sarah Green. Baldur's Gate is the largest trading city on the Sword Coast between Waterdeep on the north and the wealthy nation of Alm on the south. It's a major port where the river Chionthar reaches the sea and where the main north-south caravan road known as the Coast Way crosses that river. Um, it started as a small fishing village, but it was the home port of a far-faring sea trader and explorer, Alderan, for whom it is named. It was protected from orcs and brigands and other raiders because it has been for the longest time the home of the Flaming Fist, one of the biggest mercenary companies anywhere in the realms. And although the Flaming Fist doesn't whelm, muster, all that often. Everybody in it lives there. <laughs> uh, so when they're, they, they are sort of a sitting deterrent, so to speak. So with all of that said, conditions were golden for the success of Baldur's Gate. And that success indeed happened. The gate, as it's known, you know, colloquially, the gate has become a bustling, tolerant crossroad city with a big population. And a, it's a major caravan transshipping spot. Cargoes go from wagon to ship or vice versa, get broken down and recreated or recast. That's busy at all hours and increasingly well lit and well patrolled with a fast growing warehouse district spreading outwards in the upper city and continually displacing paddocks for livestock and caravan draft animals that have to move farther and farther out, both north and south of the River Chionsar. It's part of the Lord's Alliance, and like Waterdeep, is economically a major player in the realms, and therefore, politically too. That's incredible. Now that we've kind of gotten the brief overview, could you tell us a little bit maybe about what Baldur's Gate uh, looks like from the outside? What folks might think of Baldur's Gate and kind of the extrinsic view of, of it as a city? So imagine the the river Chionthar coming down to the sea and just when it gets to the sea there is a bowl shaped amphitheater on the on the its north bank and it's cram a city is crammed into there and with wharves and so on and the streets climb the bowl the narrow twisting streets sometimes so steep that there are steps on the streets and right up at the top the table land at the top is where increasingly the warehouses are because caravans are uh, reach there, uh, bro break down and scatter. New caravans are formed and take off from there and Baldur's Gate is a happening place. Now, what folk of the gate think of their city? Baldurians believe that their city is, of course, among the best places in the, wor in the world to dwell because it's free of tyrant kings and the grinding, starving poverty of rural places or the hungry, monster-roamed wilderlands, which is sort of how they see the rest of the realms. Now, the gate can be expensive to live in and it can be dangerous, but those with luck and who work hard can make a lot of coin and earn it and be worthy of it too. And this, Baldurians will tell you, and most of them believe it, um, is the best way to live lives, productive and working hard and seeing the rewards of that. 
Now, they will also, if you if you get a Baldurian in his or her cups, so that their tongues loosen just a little, they will also admit that you know. To be ideal, it could be a little less damp and a little less mildewy, <laughs> um, because there are fogs coming in off the sea. Uh, whenever the warmer, relatively warmer waters of the river strike the relatively colder waters of the sea, mists or can be produced, and they're known as sea fogs, and they can be quite thick. And what that means is damp air hangs in the bowl. And what that means is mildew everywhere. And so mildew is a smell that if you visit Baldur's Gate and you don't happen to be up in the upper city where the smell of um, uh, Rothay dung and and ox dung and <laughs> horse dung is... Either and, way, and, very pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there are also winds that scour up top, mm. so the fogs aren't really there. Um or on the arm, where the nobles, A, again, they're up high, so the winds come in off the sea. The sea, the sea smell is there, but they also have perfumes, and they have gardeners, and everything works to, um, and they hose down their cobbles and so on. So again, there's not too much mildew smell, because they have the spells to banish it if it arrives. Yeah. But the, in the bowl, particularly down, lower down as you get to the bowl, near the wharves, where, where it starts to compete with that dead fish smell. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, um, <laughs> it, it's all mildew. Okay, but, and, <clears throat> um, it, so your, your Baldurian who's saying, well, you know, could be less damp, could be less mildewy, will also say, and you can't be too careful around here, what with all the strange folk flocking here from all over the world just to be here. You know, where, where we are in the riches, and they bring their strange gods and their lawlessness <laughs> with them. Which, in other words, the, the same sort of, you know, that you get anywhere. But that, sure. that's how, that's all a Baldurian might, might talk to you about Baldur's Gate. Now, that brings us to what other people who aren't from Baldur's Gate think of Baldur's <laughs> Gate. And they might, if they were feeling honest, less charitable, um, not in front of an audience of Baldurians who've been drinking, uh, <laughs> might tell you it's too big, too chaotic, and it's a writhing cesspool of unscrupulous cutthroat merchants, a place where coin is king, that entirely lacks the strong guilds and long traditions of a place like, say, Waterdeep that together with the tension between guilds and nobles back in Waterdeep, at, at least a fumbling daily pretense of keeping law and order going happens. Baldur's Gate has none of that. Just bribes, bribes, <laughs> and corruption, and may the rats take the poor and the hindmost. It's what happens when you let merchants run amok, ruthless and rapacious as hungry, swarming rats, devouring... <laughs> and despoiling and showing no mercy, nor any morsels left for tomorrow, neither. I'm kind of curious what the diversity of heritages looks like in Baldur's Gate, because obviously there's a lot of travel going in and out, probably a lot of people from far off lands. Um, is it a particularly diverse place? Yes and no. It is. It's far more diverse than most places uh, that aren't trading centers of any size, like, for instance, Waterdeep or Scornubel. They're, they're going to be very diverse, okay? Sure. And to a lesser extent, all large ports, Calumport, Neverwinter, um, places like that are going to be very diverse because uh, sailors come from everywhere and the sailors have occasionally passengers on their ships from everywhere. Um, but uh, the other thing is there's a dilution factor when the place is big enough in that you just don't notice them. Right, right. Um, because there's so many seething throngs of humanity uh, busy bustling around. And in Baldur's Gate, in particular in Baldur's Gate, because of, there's not much level ground except up on the arm and up in the upper city, the new bit, um, the sight lines are bad. As in, you can't look down long vistas. You can look down the bowl towards the water, 
but you can't easily look across and see individuals on other streets. The buildings are in the way, and there's a slope, you know, so you don't get to stare across and say, oh, a lot of thry cream here today, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. because you can only see about two blocks, and there's wagons and carts, and everybody's busy, and so what you're seeing is a bunch of people of... Um, moving beings of about the same shape and and your eye may not be able to see what they are from the distance or because of what they're wearing we talked a lot about kind of like the the mercantile nature of boulders Gate, and i am curious if is that the predominant profession in boulders gate or is there any kind of like production or or craft that comes out of boulders gate or is it mostly just wheelers and dealers and traders it's mostly traders and the really busy people in Baldur's Gate are the people who make casks and small kegs, and the people who make crates and coffers, and custom make them as well, custom sizes. Wow. So Because there's con continually um, repacking stuff into smaller lots for, for sale, because guess what? A pack mule can't carry as much as a wagon, so you have to <laughs> divvy it up in smaller bits. The other thing that happens in Baldur's Gate, um, okay, let me just say one thing about what it feels like to live in water in Baldur's Gate because this leads to what we're just talking about. The gate feels like this is where it's all happening. Uh, the, uh. So the latest news, political, social, and most of all mercantile, is hotly debated. The latest is always on everyone's lips across Baldur's Gate. And as every second citizen thinks of themselves as an expert on everything as a result of this, the one thing in slender supply in Baldur's Gate is sages. Most of them can't make a living in Baldur's Gate. Unless, and here's where it gets to answering what we're talking about, unless they're experts on textile dyes or gem cutting, metallurgy, or something else directly tradeware related, sages have to dwell and work elsewhere. So when it comes to crafting in the gate, good cooks craft meals for busy people on the go, meals that are portable, uh, that you can eat while walking. Um, that's one thing that is a lot of made in the gate, and people really like that. What they don't do a lot of in the gate is brewing or distilling because it all comes in from elsewhere. Right. Um, daily. Um, but they do crafting, making things that are improving a raw product, like dyeing textiles, like recutting gems or cutting them from raw to polished, like casting in new alloys. So that sort of crafting happens a lot in the gate, particularly in the newer bits, the new suburbs that are opening, because there's space there for um, sweatshops, not to put too fine a point on it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Okay, so real quick, I wanted to let you all know that Ed was asked to do a very special introduction to the gate for a new video from YouTuber Wolfheart FPS. So be sure to check out his channel down in the description for that. And if you haven't joined the Patreon yet, then what are you waiting for? We just unlocked the free tier so you can join this rapidly growing community of Realms fans and never miss a public post or an important project update. Or if you're not ready to become a protector of the Realms, consider supporting it through his shop, link in the description. I, I am curious, however, about, about the politics of Baldur's Gate. Is it a relatively stable region, or is it like a particularly tumultuous political landscape? Ha <laughs> ha! Well, <laughs> Traditionally, um, everybody from the watch, you know, the, the street patrols that sure. police the place, right up to the top, have been a bribable, corrupt bunch. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, I mean, even even a, a patriotic Baldurian, if there is such a thing, um, <laughs> uh, would admit that, but not these days. Here's the, we're, we're in a, a glowing golden age, believe it or not. Oh, wow. In, in 1476 DR, the Council of Four, the four Grand Dukes that rule the city, 
was reinstated. Uh, they are aided uh, by the 54 member strong Parliament of Peers, uh, who elect the Dukes, and the Parliament debates everything. They formulate and vote on all legislation, presenting finished proposals to the Council. And then the Council votes on them and either proclaim them into law or rejection. They reject them, kicking them back to the Parliament for revision. And then the Council uh, has the what what we in our real world, uh, certainly in the United States of America, would call the executive branch um, of government, which uh, in this case, there are five deputies that serve the council, the harbor master, the high constable and master of walls, the master of drains and underways, the master of cobbles, and the purse master. And the purse master is the boss of the city official that most merchants down on the ground see more of than anybody else, the bailiff of the wide. Now, the bailiff of the wide is a city official who organizes schedules and records information about every merchant and vendor. And in this case, in the 1470s, DR, Jedron Hiller was the bailiff of the wide, and he grew to be openly corrupt. <laughs> and he was replaced in 1491, DR, by a female, gravel-voiced and surly, incorruptible, at least so far incorruptible, priestess of Helm, Morvratha Drorn, who is wholly devoted to fairness, transparency, and honesty. Her every waking hour, aside from morning prayers, which she does while bathing, and an evening prayer, which she does while eating, her every waking hour is devoted to patrolling and seeing to merchants in person. So at any time in the streets of Baldur's Gate, she can pop up at your elbow, whether you want it or not. Now, at first, there was a lot of grumbling about this dedication, but it's become something that all traders can trust in. They know she's fair. They like it. And believe it or not, this has over time caused a boom in trade because, hey, we can trust things now. This is a level playing field. You know, some of the smuggling and, and getting robbed in the streets, the muggings and so on is going down. And we're going to be treated fairly. And if we suffer a reverse, we have redress to the bail of the wide. And, and so it, it's working. That's fantastic. One thing that I always found super fascinating about Baldur's Gate as well is that it's actually, it's, it's home to some of the most acclaimed explorers in all of the realms. Um, you know, uh, Balduran. Uh, Davern Sashen Star. For folks that are up on their realm's history, they would know that th these are very accomplished explorers. Uh, what do you think it is about Baldur's Gate that lends itself to, to I guess, putting out these kinds of people, these kinds of grand explorers? Well, I think it's because Baldur's Gate is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> now, I mean, that, 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 that sounds flippant and dismissive, but what I mean is it's isolated. It's at the mouth of a river, so a big river, a navigable for a a long way river, um, so it dominates trade up and down the river, and then it is a seaport, and both and it is on a major overland coastal trade road, um, and all of those are about travel. Mm -hmm. It's about um, making coin by moving stuff, right? And um, therefore, if you want to get successful, you do a lot of traveling, and uh, Baldurin sailed across the Sea of Swords. He was an explorer. He mapped islands along the way. And Davern Sashenstar was the same thing only on land. And and I think all of this, Baldurin and and sailors since, Davern Sashenstar and merchant traders since, it's because you had to travel in order to make a buck. And and in I think in the case of both Baldurin and Davern Sashenstar, they had wanderlust. They loved traveling and they wanted to see more and more of the world. I think that's what drove them. And as a result, they were incredibly successful uh, financially. Um, and then everybody else saw that and said, oh, this is what we have to do. So I think that's that established that. Absolutely. Okay, Sarah Greenwood, it looks like we've gotten to that part of the show where we uh, reveal some untold secrets of Baldur's Gate. And I've been told that you have some juicy ones for us today. Are you willing to share? It's entitled... The dark secret that's stirring 
in Baldur's Gate. (laughs) (laughs) For so long have the Iron Throne, the Merchant's League, the Zentrum, and various priests of Baal attempting to assemble and control Baalspawn fought each other and wreaked havoc on the supply of iron and the weapons trade in the city that no one quite paid attention to why the Zents failed to take over once the Iron Throne collapsed and the Merchants League had been so weakened, largely by the Iron Throne, (laughs) uh, even with the opportunity afforded by Grand Duke Valarkans, supported by Lycanthropes, failed coup attempt, except, of course, the Zents. The Zents did pay attention because they were the ones being thwarted. (laughs) <laughs> they found themselves foiled by dragons and humans, dragonborn and others from Kanku, there are the Kanku again, to, quote, monsters working for those dragons. But why? Why would dragons care which particular humans control Baldur's Gate? Well, it might have something to do with the local legends of buried treasure. And it does, which is something more Baldurians would know if they had more sages to listen to and were in the habit of listening to them. Over time, those legends have waxed more and more poetic about how stupendously rich Baldurin the Explorer got and how he buried his treasure deep under the city, guarded by titans in stasis or chimerae kept alive by throwing criminals condemned to death down secret shafts for them to devour, or an army of golems, or even a sleeping Tarask. All of these are embellishments, I'm being polite and saying embellishments, as any good sage could tell you. And those good sages could tell you something else, too, that the tales of buried treasure were much much simpler, and they were tales told at first by dragons. Which leads us <laughs> to that dark secret at last. The dragon tales that most Baldurians believe tell of Baldurin's buried treasure somewhere deep under the city actually refer to buried trezor. <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> they actually refer to buried trezor, T, R, E, Z, or Z, O, R, R, trezor. Trezor is a primordial. Oh come on! Sp- specifically, an ooze archomental, <laughs> who can turn rock in. To a sludge that it can see and navigate through, and then it can leave this sludge to harden again in its wake. So, if it awakens under ar- or the arm and the bowl, it can cause subsidences, collapses, with buildings shattered and toppled, and great loss of life as it moves. Trezor was magically bound deep under the edge where the arm and the bowl meet on the north side of the river Chionsar, by the magic of six dragons working together when they rebelled against the primordials long, long ago. Their spells robbed Trezor of the use of its rock liquefying powers, wreaking something on its mind rather like the feeble mind spell known to wizards. So, it was trapped, left merged with solid rock in stasis. At the time it was imprisoned, Trezor was seeking the Athora and other magical masses of rock located across Toril to try and drain their magic and make itself more mighty. So when freed, it will probably resume this effort, moving to such magical nodes, and the nearest such nodes are under Cormir, near High Horn, and under Evereska. Trezor has been stirring throughout the 1400s DR, dreaming more vividly of the surface world 
and sending its urges and wants into the dreams of sentient monsters such as dragons and wyverns and drakes, who are being slowly influenced and guided by it, <laughs> which would lead to the first of our three <laughs> lore secrets. And the first lore secret is the dragons are taking in an interest in Baldur's Gate. The dragons who imprisoned Trezor so long ago are long, long dead and gone. But there are dragons who fled Larakond, who worked hard at mastering arcane spells and devising their own new ones, and a family of green dragons who've mastered as much of the art as many archmages have long been resident in, guess what, the Forest of Worms. Led by a matriarch, Beralalagra, and her consort, Truindragar, who keep their six children under six strict discipline, the Brer Brood, as they're collectively referred to, have long been interested in gathering wealth through investments in Baldur's Gate, a city they watch over by means of many hired and coerced Kanku and human spies. Utterly uninterested in fighting adventurers or anyone else, they have constructed a false lair in ruin-topped caverns at the edge of the forest and, working with their agents, have stalked it with a wide variety of monsters from all over Toril, which they keep hungry and keep penned into the lair with the aid of Tavara's Talons, a veteran band of hired and evil adventurers. In dreams, Trezor is sending to the Brer Brood that rich treasure lies in caverns deep beneath the gate, and all they have to do is tunnel down from the deepest mines under Duskhawk Hill, heading west as well as deeper, to reach it. Nor are the Brer Brood the only dragons paying attention to the gate. A copper dragon named here then I have Navalar. <laughs> Go Sorry. Go ahead. Please continue. <laughs> Here there is Navalar has been dwelling in the city in human form as Gosh. the money lender and investor this one's easier. <laughs> Handor Vrance. So just the word hand with O R on the end, and his last name is Vrance, um, for decades, keeping close watch on mercantile trends and shifting politics, and working with the Harpers, who uh, don't know they're dealing with the dragon, by sharing information about Zendrim plots, Red Wizard spying, and attempts by various former allies of the Iron Throne to revive that organization or take over its covert weapons dealing role. And finally, the Black Dragon Marok Lagar. That's a good one who recently slew other worms and took over their lairs in the Troll Mountains, has decided that he wants to ruin Baldur's Gate, slaying most of its inhabitants and laying waste to much of the city, only to withdraw, let humans rebuild and reoccupy the gate, and then devastate it again. However, he wants the city to be much larger and full of far more riches than it is now before he does this and he's taking great delight in acting as a human, using newly mastered spells that let him shapeshift for long periods with precision, and exploring the city. He is like a willful child with a new toy right now, and he's in no hurry to devastate. This is all so much fun. Various temples and shrines around the gate have seen altar visions of dragons, and talk of it has spread. So... Inevitably, there are now Cult of the Dragon agents nosing around the city too, looking for where dragons might be hiding so they can approach and make contact and begin to convince worms to live forever, served by us. <laughs> so, the next new secret lore. Well, it's not really secret, it's an update. The Traitor Duke and the Lycanthrope Scheme. After their failed coup, Grand Duke Valarkin and the band of the Red Moon Lycanthropes escaped, and they're still out there. But as they all get older, in this case much older, <laughs> they're no longer trying to seize open rule of anywhere. Instead, 
They've decided they want to control wealthy merchant families and get what they want, which is power, wealth, good food and drink, and luxurious lives of idleness. You know, what we're all after. Exactly, what we're all after. (laughs) Uh, uh, Yeah, Uh, they want to get what they want that way. Their chosen targets are the following wealthy, successful merchant families. The houses of Dravren, who have extensive holdings in Alm as well as the gate, investments in many businesses including livestock breeding and sales, metal mining and smelting, and weapons making and selling. Uh, the, the house Terethmaster, who are the local sword makers and makers of arrows in the gate. And... They're also investors in several shipyards and in rope makers. And House Baralin, who have a history of hairy, heavy-set, brawling, hot-tempered males who have been dubbed toads and worse by foes. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 yeah, House Baralin are landlords to many in the gate, as well as owners of glass making metal casting, alloy smithing, and bulk seed sales in the gate. The the Lycanthropes and Valarkin, who have taken to calling themselves the Lurking Lords, I guess they're writing their own memoirs or something, <laughs> uh, are, are using various assumed names and keeping to human form. Uh, by the way, Valarkin is now a Lycanthrope himself, having been bitten many times after taking Lycanthrope lovers over the years, to invest in the ventures of these three families, make friendships among the family members, and drift, oh, so subtly, into positions of trusted advisors. And as their work is genuinely enriching the families, fixing those families' mistakes, and strengthening their influence and reach, the families are increasingly embracing them, each family unaware that the other families are receiving similar aid and support. So the lurking lords are playing a very patient, long game, and are in no hurry to do anything at all, dramatic, public, or violent, as long as they can continue to build successes and make coin that they can share in. At least one Tereth master, Alavrond, is beginning to dream of a grand duke for himself, (laughs) and with the covert support he's getting, he may just achieve it. Someday, <laughs> which in fact yeah. brings us to our our last lore secret of the day, Ed. Ah, yes, and this one is called Sarfoon's Sea Spell. And who is Sarfoon? Sarfoon is a pompous, blustering, short, fat, middle-aged mage possessed of a huge, honey blonde beard and a very high opinion of himself. <laughs> and he's suddenly risen to wealth and public notice in the gate because of a spell he devised. His sea spell is a magic that takes him a day to cast and leaves him utterly exhausted, as well as requiring a large array of cheap but odd material components that take some time and trouble to assemble. Feathers of this or that bird, particular sorts of rocks that have been smoothed into pebbles by the sea, leaves and roots of particular well plants, um the blood of particular sea birds, and so on. Its effects are to consume seawater and seaweed, and by doing so, transform one fish into three of the same kind. (laughs) And the two new fish being as edible and nutritious as the original, and those two new fish, but not the original, are compelled by the magic to rush ashore. So, a great rush of fish beach themselves and can readily be collected by anyone fast and brutal enough to fend off the gulls that swoop for the fish. Sarfoon employs gangs of children and street youths from Baldur's Gate who are skilled with slings to kill gulls for collection. The, the gulls get collected and used as farm fertilizer. So a large number of fish can be harvested without need for ships, or nets, or skilled fisherfolk, and they can be harvested in short order. This has led to Sarfoon being hardly hated by some fisherfolk who want him dead, <laughs> uh, but also 
to his making deals with at least two rival makers of smoked fish, kegged in oil for bulk shipping and sale elsewhere, and <clears throat> Sarfoon's efforts in this regard have on at least five occasions resulted in entire caravans of smoked fish in oil setting off east to feed landlocked cities in eastern Alm and Tethyr. Others who want to learn the sea spell are coming to the gate to try to convince Sarfoon to teach them, or they're trying to capture him and coerce him into doing so, and the proud Sarfoon has just realized the peril he's in and gone into hiding. Someone, perhaps one of those dragon agents seeking ways down to treasure deep beneath the city, is helping Sarfoon hide by spreading word of at least a dozen false Sarfoons, and in the process, setting traps for the Sarfoon hunters so they can <laughs> capture their own pet wizards from elsewhere and compel these captives to work various magics for them. All of which is alarming the Council of Four and the Parliament of Peers, who are right now debating if they should hire adventurers to sort out the Sarfoons and find out what by all the watching gods is going on in their city. And if you want access to Sarfoon's Sea Spell, be sure to uh, check the link in the description where you can get access to that through our Patreon. So another thing is that you said it took a lot of, uh, I guess, very particular material components. Is this something that a powerful mage might be able to cast with just an arcane focus instead of having to mess with material components? I I don't know. Um, they would probably have to experiment with the spell. Uh. Um, now, the, the thing... The, the, what it does is transforms seawater and seaweed into the fish. Um, but it seems to need a lot of these material components, which are consumed, of course, in the spell casting, um, as sort of catalysts. So that would argue that an arcane focus could take the place of... Remember, Sarfoon isn't that good a mage. <laughs> right. He just thinks he right. is. <laughs> So he stumbled upon this thing that works, and he doesn't want to mess with the... He's, for the first time in his life, he's, he has a success on his hands, and he's just riding it for all it's worth. He, he, he doesn't have time to experiment when he can cast these things and make money. So he's making money for the first time in his life. You know. So, yeah, I would say that you could probably change all those material components. Welcome back, my friends, to the little segment of the show we call Realm Speak, where we stumble over words you may encounter in the realms, names, phrases, and words that you might stumble over. We stumble over them for you, so you don't have to. And this time around, we're doing this. Prestidigitation. Prestidigitation. Is not a realm's word per se, it's a real world word that came into D&D &D as a, one of the descriptors for magic because it is indeed in the real world uh, one of the descriptors for magic prestidigitation is sleight of hand so you get so you can say it fast prestidigitation prestidigitation the folk of the arm are just as wealthy and just as exclusive as they've always been but they just can't dominate so many new folk who are so far away the way they have dominated the middle class merchants and the the lower class workers they literally look down on in the bowl of the old city the new outlying districts